I was invited to give this talk by Dr. Alarcon, being invited to give a talk on a subject about which she knows more than I do was uh, an honor in some sense, but she could have given um, a bang up talk herself on the same subject. And in the audience, although the bright lights prevent me from seeing specific things, there are many other people in um, North America with whom I've done collaborations over the years who equally should have been invited to get the talk. There are very strong groups at Boston and Baltimore and Chicago. Um, Cella's former colleagues at UAB and UBC and many other places is doing very good work on health disparities issues related to lupus. But today I wanted to start by reviewing some of the work that Dr. Alarcon and colleagues have done in their um, now quite famous LUMINA study. LUMINA stands for Lupus and Minorities, Nature versus Nurture. And I think LUMINA is, study has been critical to our understanding of racial and ethnic disparities in lupus. And part of the reason is it's the first systematic longitudinal study of Hispanics from Texas and Puerto Rico, African Americans and Caucasians followed for close to two decades. And I think the most important aspect is both that racial and ethnic diversity, but also the fact that in a single data set, they included socioeconomic data, demographic, clinical, immunologic, genetic, psychological and behavioral. And I think this, as those of us who do work in lupus knows, befits the complexity of lupus and the diversity of its course. So what are some of the key findings from Lumina? Well, early in disease, they discovered that generic, genetic factors play a key role in disease activity. But over time, socioeconomic factors become more important in outcomes. They found that poverty rather than race and ethnicity is the primary determinant of mortality after onset of disease. And that overall socioeconomic fa factors are also crucial in determining quality of life and disability associated with disease after its early phases. They noted that physicians and people with lupus differ in the weight they place on components of disease activity. Physicians weight physical findings, lab tests much more highly, while the patients themselves weight subjective sense of well-being and quality of life much more highly. So there's some discrepancy in what they view about the disease. Another finding that was important was that race ethnicity was associated with specific manifestations of disease, with both genetics and socioeconomics playing roles in how that played out. And lastly, in a very important study that has implications far beyond Lumina and far beyond lupus in general, they observed that the term Hispanic was too heterogeneous to permit aggregation in SLE studies. The Hispanics in Texas have a, had a different mix of genetic risks and much lower socioeconomic status than the Hispanics from Puerto Rico. So, but there are many other crucial findings in the health disparities literature upon which Lumina and our own studies, which I'll describe in a second, build. Studies from um, Mike Ward, now at NIH, formerly of Stanford, and others in the Boston group, they noted that doctors and hospitals with higher volumes of lupus patients achieve much better outcomes, but that the relationship between volume and outcomes was stronger for non-whites. It's been noted also that avoidable hospitalizations for lupus were more common for those of low socioeconomic status. That lack of social support lower self-efficacy, the sense that you could, were confident you could do something, and lower health literacy were more common than those of low SES, and all of these are associated with poorer long-term outcomes. 
Also, it's been noted that area socioeconomic characteristics are associated with renal outcomes, but the effect is different for various racial and ethnic groups. And it should be noted, and we'll show from studies we're doing at UCSF, that there's an effect of the community's poverty beyond the effect of the individual's poverty. They interact in statistical terms. So with that as the background to the current studies that we and others are involved in, we're following the leads. So the questions we ask, what is it about lower socioeconomic status that results in differential access to health care and to poorer outcomes? Is it the characteristics of the individuals with the condition? Is it the characteristics of the communities in which people with lupus live? Or is it the characteristics of the particular health care system in the U.S.? So we're asking then, what is it about SLE that would make it more difficult for people of socioeconomic, lower socioeconomic status to achieve good outcomes? And we have some plausible hypotheses based on the research that's already been completed. Is it the relative rarity? Most physicians are not experienced in taking care of SLE. Others with whom I've been talking the last few days note that in the community, doctors are pretty comfortable taking care of rheumatoid arthritis, but they always refer on lupus to tertiary care centers, or generally do. Is it the complexity of the disease, the involvement of multiple organ systems, which requires interaction with multiple providers? And perhaps there's an interaction between that and the neuropsychiatric manifestations, which may impair the ability to organize one's care. So this is a pic picture that describes the kind of work that we're doing. Through most of my career, I've been trolling on the outer perimeters of this map of lupus outcomes, um, studying the impact of the local and national environment, as I'll describe more in detail, the nature of the healthcare system and how they interact with the individual. But because of um, some fantastic junior faculty who work with me at UCSF, um, we're doing studies inside the box too, looking at the impacts of doctor-patient interactions, um, both the quality of those interactions and the nature of the way that doctors communicate with patients and how they affect the healthcare and the ultimate outcomes of disease. This cartoon from New Yorker, I think, may sum up some of the results, unfortunately, I'm going to present to you today. And it suggests that when you buy somebody a get well card in a card shop, that you may need different ones for those who have insurance and those who don't. Um, as you know, in the US, close to 50 million of our 330 million citizens don't have any health insurance. And just to give a little background on the U.S. healthcare system, since it's what I'm focusing on in part of my talk, the problem of not having insurance is more pronounced among those who are poor. Over 30% of the poor don't have insurance. But note that among the richest category in this slide, those with household incomes of over 75,000, they're still almost 10% without insurance. So 10 million people who are quite affluent don't have insurance, and that may be because their employers stop providing it, or because the typical family policy, if you have to buy it yourself, costs over $16,000 a year in the US. It's not just the lack of insurance, but also a lot of people who have insurance don't have very thorough insurance. And so people have coined the term underinsured. And they define that as when you have medical expenses that are greater than 10% of income, or 5% if you're a low income individual, or you have deductibles of 5% of income. So you have to spend that amount out of money because your insurance is limited in the scope. In the US, both the number of, and of uninsured has been growing, but the proportion who are underinsured or don't have good coverage has been growing even faster. 
Therefore, the remainder of the population, which here we deem adequately insured, has declined to about 56% of the population. These things matter. Um, in this slide, we look at the proportion of the population who go without care due to costs or who have medical care bill problems or medical care debt. So if you look at the first thing, people who went without care due to the costs, those only 28% of those with adequate insurance, or maybe we should say even with those with adequate insurance, 28%. And it goes up. For those with underinsurance, almost half went without care due to the costs, and 63% of the uninsured. When you look at if you have a medical problem or a medical care debt, um, roughly a quarter of those with adequate insurance still see that problem. Among those who are underinsured, half do, and almost 60% among the uninsured. Also, there's a co coverage problem that goes beyond just money. Often, coverage limits the kind of things that you can get from your healthcare providers, as this other New Yorker slide indicates. Uh-oh, your coverage doesn't seem to include illness. So the work we've been doing at UCSF, and I think it builds on the Lumina example, we have developed with funding from NIH and other sources what we call the Lupus Outcome Study. Enrollment began in 2002, and it's been recruited from both clinical and community-based sources. But I think the most critical thing is over two-thirds of the people were, were um, recruited from sources other than clinical centers which is always a problem in the U.S., getting people who you identify independent of their provider. Although the majority are, are from California, in the lupus outcome study, 40 states are represented. The diagnosis was verified by medical record review, but the primary data source is an annual structured telephone survey, which collects data on socioeconomics, disease activity and manifestations, medications, disability, employment, general health and functioning, psychosocial factors, healthcare utilization, and health insurance. Periodically, we update the information from the medical record review, and gradually, we've done complete genotyping um, up to contemporary standards for that. Overall, in the study, we've included 1,300 people with at least one interview. At this point, we've accumulated 7,500 person years of observation, an average of about six per person. There have been several waves of enrollments. We've been very successful in retaining them, 94% year to year, including deaths. I should note that the annual mortality rate is about 1.3% and we had just under 800 um, in our latest completed wave. Here are some of the characteristics of the people whom we're following. About a quarter are under age 45. 64% are white, so it is in fact quite diverse sample with significant numbers of Hispanics, Blacks, Asian and Pacific Islanders. The other category is usually people who report two or more races. In terms of education, about 17% a, a uh, of them have a high school education or less. Because of the Bay Area predominance in the study, there are also quite a lot who have um, high levels of education. Despite that, 14% of them meet stringent criteria for poverty using U.S. government standards for that. We don't have a lot of people without insurance, but as you'll see, that still has consequences. 46% receive their employment, um, their insurance through their employer, and 51% are either on Medicaid, which that's the U.S. program for people of low income, Medicare, which is the program for people who are 65 and older or um, severely disabled or some combination of the two. 
So now I'm gonna turn to some of the results of our studies. First, looking at the impact of the US health system on access and utilization for lupus. And I begin with the work of a former fellow who's now an associate professor at National Jewish Hospital in Denver. She came convinced that the patients on Medicaid were not getting access because they were traveling humongous distances for the UCSF clinic. And we looked at the data in our national sample. In fact, what we found was the Medicaid patients were traveling roughly twice as far and uh, an extra hour and a half, the time not in the slide, than the rest of the patients um, in the national sample. So clearly, um, there's a gap in care for people with Medicaid. What's interesting, when we looked at the data, in fact, among the Medicaid people who are traveling long distance, those were the ones with higher education. In effect, they were using their education to overcome the physical distance and were able to get to tertiary care providers in that way. And that proved a very key insight to us in understanding things on what affects care of people with lupus. When we looked at the number of physician visits by race, even after adjusting for differences in severity and other characteristics of the individual, we didn't find that non-whites had less visits. In fact, they may have had statistically significantly more visits than the, the whites, and that, of course, may be for, due to imperfect control for disease severity. On the other hand, look on the right side of this slide, which takes into account adjustment for severity, there were tremendous differences in the number of physician visits for lupus by education level. With those with a high school education or less, having about 20% fewer visits to the lupus doc, principal lupus doctor, um, compared to those with more education. We also looked at the number of physician visits as a function of the kind of insurance that people had, and probably reflecting severity differences even after adjustment, those on our public programs had more visits to the physician, probably as a marker of their severity. But then when we looked at even adjusting for the individual's own characteristics, their severity, and their individual socioeconomic status, what we found was that people who lived in a poverty area, defined as an area in which there are a lot of other people who are poor, concentrated poverty areas, we might recognize them as either urban ghettos or um, rural areas of poverty. That those people had about 25% fewer visits to the doctor than those who lived in not poor areas. Obviously, this reflects, we believe, an access problem. We also found that if you live in areas with more rheumatologists per capita, looking again at the right of the two sets of bar graphs, which adjust for severity and socioeconomic differences, that living in an area with more rheumatologists per capita does increase the number of visits that you get to the doctor. So it matters how many rheumatologists there are around. We also looked, for those of you not from the US, um, in our system, some people are in fee for service where the insurance company pays the doctor a little bit every time they visit the doctor. Others are in what are called prepaid or managed care plans. And um, what we found is that the latter, people in the latter kind of plans had fewer visits even after adjusting for severity differences. So the kind of health insurance you have, even among those with insurance, affects the quantity of care they received. And that's also true in terms of lupus-related hospital admissions, that those in the fee-for-service system, and this may not be a good thing, have about 10 to 15 percent more hospital admissions per capita than um, those in the managed care sector. That 
could be um, that the physicians and the hospitals in some sense at the margin are deciding to admit people in the fee-for-service system when they wouldn't in the managed care system. So those are some of the differences in terms of the quantity of care. Let's turn now to the quality of the care that's provided in um, doctor-patient interactions. My colleague, Dr. Janus Jazdani, um, spearheaded an effort to develop quality indicators, QIs for short, for lupus. Quality indicators rep represent an attempt to measure a minimal level of what ought be done to, for lupus. And an example would be if a patient is on immunosuppressive therapy, then an inactivated influenza vaccination should occur annually unless contraindicated. The quality, indica quality indicator set she develops spans 20 aspects of care, covering diagnosis, general preventive strategies, for instance, vaccination, sun avoidance counseling, osteoporosis prevention, prevention and treatment, drug toxicity monitoring, renal disease care, and reproductive health. Because we collect our data by self-report, 13 of these 20 were amenable to self-report and have been included for about five years now in our annual lupus outcomes survey. There's an overall measure of the quality of care, not just for lupus, the um, term pass rate is used as an overall indicator of quality. It's defined as the number of quality indicators for which an individual is eligible that he or she received. Obviously, somebody who's much sicker will be eligible for more. And the question is, are they receiving those for which they're eligible? And what you see here is that the quality of care differs quite substantially by race. So whites have about, oh, 5% more quality indicators that they're eligible for than non-whites, even after adjustment for statistical, for um, severity and socioeconomic status differences. The difference is even slightly more pronounced when you look at it by poverty status, where the poor are getting fewer quality indicators than are people who are not poor that they're eligible for. When we looked at, remember from one of my first slides, we only have 3% of the people in our sample who don't have any insurance, thankfully. But it still has profound impact, and this was a statistically significant relationship. Those without insurance get 50% fewer of the quality indicators for which they're eligible than those with other kinds of health insurance. I should note that the public managed care sector, the HMO, the um, aqua bar, the second from the left, actually did the best in terms of providing. So maybe the organized systems of care worked in terms of the quality of the care. But the most important finding on this slide is those without insurance have poor quality care. We also looked at the overall pass rate by the specialty of the physician for lupus. And I know because I think this is indicative of the issue of coordination, lots of times the three bars on the right, which are care solely by a rheumatologist, care by a generalist or by some combination, do substantially better than those who are, whose principal lupus doctor is from another specialty. An example might be, and I'm not picking one out just uh, at, you know, we could pick several of them, but typically it would be if you develop a renal manifestation, your nephrologist becomes your principal lupus doctor. And what we see is they don't do an, as overall a good job in terms of the quality indicators as the other um, physician specialties on the right. Now I'm going to turn to whether or not these quality indicators measured prospectively can predict, predict worsening outcomes down the road. For the next several slides, we analyze the impact on slack, uh, 
It's a um, self-report measure of disease activity that was developed in Boston and which we've been using for several years. And we define um, worsening in terms of a clinically meaningful change in the SLAC measure greater than half a standard deviation. In this slide, we look at whether or not having an overall quality indicator pass rate greater than 90% affects the disease activity down the road. And you see that it doesn't, there's no statistically significant difference in disease activity by whether or not you had a high pass rate. Similarly, there were no racial and ethnic differences in the disease activity measure. There's a slight trend, but it wasn't statistically significant for the poor to have a worsening clinical um, disease activity measure. And then there was a statistically significant difference where those with college degrees or more were um, had a much lower odds for a high disease, worsening disease activity when measured prospectively in this way. Lastly, we look at the impact of insurance. Look at the bar again. We had very little statistical power, but this is a very strong relationship nevertheless. People who didn't have insurance several years later had, were more than twice as likely as most of the groups to have um, a worsening disease activity down the road. I turn now to, we developed in our group a measure of self-report of disease damage, which has been validated. And we look here at the impact of um, a clinically meaningful worsening in the disease damage score over about a five-year period. In this first slide, by whether or not they have a high rate of quality indicator, a high pass rate. And you can see that those who had good quality care, greater than 90% of the quality indicators for which they're eligible, had an odds ratio for worsening disease damage over time of 0.2. Um, when I loaded my slides, it put the, the non-US, non-Canada version, that comma rather than the decimal point. This is a profound difference in disease damage over a five-year period. We looked at whether there was difference in disease damage by race, ethnicity, and you see that there wasn't. By poverty status, and again, those who were poor had twice the odds of disease damage down the road as those who weren't poor. Then we looked at it by education, um, and the results are not as clear cut as for poverty in this case, but on balance, those with more education had a higher odds of worsening disease activity. And finally, we looked at the change by insurance status, and the results weren't as clear as they were for disease activity, which I showed before. Interestingly, the odds here, because remember, on some of the quality indicator measures, the public sectors had done very well public health sectors of insurance have done very well, not so in terms of the disease damage down the road to the extent that we controlled for disease severity or not, as the case may be. So now I'd like to finally turn to examining things that go on between the lupus patient and um, his or her physician, looking at the quality of the interactions for lupus care. So we've developed patient-centered measures to assess MD patient interactions in lupus. What patient-centered measures measure what patients value in healthcare. It measures the aspects of care for which patients are the best or only source of information. 
And we've adapted rigorously tested instruments with extensive field testing, but for the um, use in lupus research. The items come from the Consumer Assessment of Health Plan batteries developed by the U U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to monitor processes of care, and items from the Interpersonal Process of Care Scales, which were developed by colleagues at UCSF to monitor how people from vulnerable populations experience the healthcare system. The outcome measures here are um, grouped by domains. The items are scored on a four or five point Likert scale. We transformed those to zero to 100, with zero being the worst care possible and 100 being perfect care. The domains in, um, that we covered included patient provider communication, care coordination, shared decision making about care, promptness or timeliness of care, trust in the provider and assessment of the health plan. And these are the first uh, we have, just got fresh out of the computer, performance on patient experience measures by the major domains. For some domains, like communication between the doctor and the patient, 90% or more um, agreed that the care was um, quite good. The scores were in 90s in the 0 to 100 scale. They were very high for trust in the provider. They were reasonably high for both coordination of care and assessment of the health plan, but they were not very good. They were 43 on the 100 scale for shared decision making about treatment plans. So in terms of care coordination, we look here at the impact of various kinds of insurance. Based on the questions, how often did your main lupus doctor seem informed up to date about the care you got from other doctors? And how often did this provider seem to know the important information about your medical history? And there were some differences by the kind of insurance with slightly lower ratings for those in the public sector. In terms of access or promptness to care by poverty status, we asked when you phone this provider's office to get an appointment for care you needed right away, how often did you get an appointment as soon as you need it? Or when you made an appointment for a checkup or routine care, how often did you get an appointment as soon as you needed it? And then I array in this slide the data by whether or not the individual was poor or not poor, and surprisingly, um, the poor, not surprisingly, the poor rated things um, less highly than did the not poor. Finally, I turn to the last strain of the work that our group is doing, where we're looking at the impact of the community on healthcare utilization and outcomes in lupus after taking personal characteristics of the individual into account. In this slide, in work by my colleague Chris Tonner and um, the rest of our group, we look at the combination of personal and community socioeconomic status and the number of physician visits for lupus. On this slide, things are a little clearer on the left side, so I'll walk you through in terms of education. And what you see is the combination of having a low level of education and living in an area of concentrated poverty, a poor neighborhood, you have many fewer doctor visits, 50% fewer than those who have high educations and live in areas other than those of concentrated poverty. We also looked at the impact of community factors on the quality of care. We evaluated the independent impact of living in large and small urban areas and rural areas on the overall pass rate, which I described earlier, and the impact on two important ones, screening for cardiovascular risks and drug toxicity monitoring. The areas of, differed by very small percentages on these measures, with persons in small urban areas having the highest pass rates, 
and rates of receipt of cardiovascular disease risk assessment and toxicity monitoring. But now I'm going to turn to some of the outcomes of disease. On this slide, we look at the impact of concentrations of poverty beyond the individual's own situation on physical function um, measured by the SF36 physical function scale. Here, the left side is again the most indicative, and you can see that those who are poor and live in a poor neighborhood, if you're not familiar, the SF36 has scored zero for really bad health to 100, the best health, and you can see there's a perfect monotonic relationship. If you're poor but don't live in a poor neighborhood, you're slightly better than if you're poor and do live in an area of concentrated poverty and the relationship goes up. So the scores are highest, that's best, for those who aren't personally poor and don't live in an area of concentrated poverty. This slide, we array the data by depression. We use the CESD depression scale and the dotted line indicates those points above which it's considered consistent with a high level of depressive symptoms. Um, since these are self-report, we don't have a formal diagnosis. Of note, the only individuals who are below the dotted line are those who are personally not poor and don't live in an area of concentrated poverty. All of the other three groups are above the line, and the scores of those who are personally poor and live in an area of concentrated poverty are consistent with, well, this is almost an alarm bell level in the CESD. You would be very concerned about the welfare of somebody who had a score just under 30. So to summarize what I've described so far, Access, healthcare utilization, doctor patient communication, quality of care, and outcomes are affected by who you are, the kinds of insurance you have or don't have, the specialty of the physician seen, and the kind of clinic in which you receive care. Access, healthcare utilization, and outcomes are affected by where you live above and beyond your own characteristics. So the Affordable Care Act, the health reform in the US, which sometimes is called Obamacare, originally by his critics and um, more recently by him himself, the Affordable Care Act will reduce the number without insurance in the US. But we've seen that insurance is only one among many factors that affect the welfare of people with lupus. There are wide disparities even among those with good access and good coverage. So we know that coverage does not guarantee high quality care. And health care is not sufficient to permit good outcomes. We want to assess the reasons that certain health plans, particularly the public sector managed care, have a positive access on some aspects of access and outcomes. Is it the specialist mix, the teaching hospital affiliation, Organized systems of care with the principal lupus physician being part of it, or culturally relevant care. We need to figure out whether this is about communities with high concentrations of the poor that accentuates the disadvantage of individual poverty. I'm, I'm sorry that, to interrupt, Dr. Yellen, but you're over just time. One more slide. It's the central focus of my research now. We're looking at tangible aspects of the neighborhood, such as the absence of positive things like food stores and the like, and presence of negative things like pollution crime. We're analyzing some intangible things, like the absence of other people with experience in healthcare systems, social networks that don't include those likely to have knowledge of specialists in lupus care. We're looking at comparisons of communities with high concentrations of the poor that differ in outcomes. These can be very informative, and research in other diseases indicates some communities buffer poverty much more effectively than others. And lastly, 
We're thinking of conducting a trial to improve communication between physicians and patients. Won't go through the details, but we've just completed one in rheumatoid arthritis that was very fruitful. So the coda for the future. There are gaps in outcomes that are often larger than the potential impact of our best treatment modalities for lupus, especially after the initial onset of disease. Research by others and by us indicates that health policy can play an important role. Differences in access and resultant differences in outcomes are artifacts of how we deliver health care. Communication across social class and cultural divides may be improved. Differences across similarly disadvantaged communities shows that the effects of race and class may be mutable. And I will close by just saying, re reducing gaps that are mutable is a matter of justice. Even as we endeavor to find more effective treatments, we have to distribute those that we have more equitably than we do. I would like to acknowledge funding from NIAMS, from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, from the ACR, Arthritis Foundation, the state of California, and thank colleagues and staff. This is a staff picture of our center and its advisory board, and you'll notice that we're not silly. We took advantage of Chella's expertise and brought her in as an advisor. Thank you very much.